Hi, my name is Henry Smith. Welcome to another episode of Digging for Truth. Today I'm joined in the studio with my friend, colleague, and professional archaeologist, Dr. Bryant Wood. Hi, Bryant. How are you? Good. Good it's, to be here, it's Henry. It's good to see you here in the studio. Yes. We're uh, very excited to have you. I'm excited to be here. Well, we've got a, an ex, uh, a great topic to talk about today. And it has to do with, uh, we're going to jump right into it. I say this every episode, we're going to jump right into it because we have a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about the excavations that ABR has done at Kerbet el Makater, which we've identified as the Eye of Joshua. And of course, uh, you're the one who led up uh, this research over 20 years ago. So let's talk for the audience a little bit first, to sort of lay a foundation uh, uh, about the city of Ai in Joshua 7 and 8. Uh, could you share with the audience what the skeptics have said for decades about I and its relationship to the Bible? Well, the location of I has been a controversial issue in biblical archaeology. And there is a place that uh, scholars identified as I. It's called Et Tel, right. uh, about 10 miles north of Jerusalem. And uh, they say, well, that, that we believe this is the place uh, that's written about in Joshua 7 and 8. However, it does not match the biblical description in that there was no occupation at the time of Joshua. Right. Now you'd think, wow, this, isn't this a major problem in this yeah. identification? But right. that, for the liberal critic scholar, that doesn't matter. They just say, well, obviously the biblical story was made up yes. based on the ruins at, at Tell. Right. And the person who really kind of set it in stone, this identification, uh, was W.F. Albright, who's considered the father of biblical archaeology, uh, in an article he wrote back in the 1920s where he looked at possible places for uh, I, and he decided that the only possible candidate was this at Tell because there were ruins there from an early time period. And he said, uh, there's, there's no other candidate for in, I. in the area. So this must yeah. be it. This must be it. In other words, yeah. it was an identification by default because they right. didn't have a better candidate. And <laughs> Albright was, was, um, was what we call the father of biblical archaeology, right? Uh, yeah. He had a moder moderate respect for the Bible, I would he say. He did, he did. And, and so people looked to him uh, with respect and said, oh, well, it's Albright saying it, so it must be sure. correct. Sure. So we're just going to bring a couple, couple typical quotes up on the screen here, mm -hmm. and I'll read them, you know, and uh, these speak for themselves. But here's one from Joseph Calloway. Now, he was involved, right, right in the excavations at, at, at yes, Tell. Yes, he was. Right. He says, check this out, uh, archaeology has wiped out the historical credibility of the conquest of I, as reported in Joshua 7 and 8. Right, This is very typical oh, yes. what you find in the literature. Oh, yes. And then we have another one here from uh, um, uh, Zioni Zevit. Am I saying that right? Zioni? Is that Zevit, I think that's yeah. correct. All right. And sure, the evidence shows that there was no city at I for the Israelites to conquer. So um, we're just bringing those quotes up just to show people like this is, this is what mm -hmm. we find in it's, the academic it's, literature. It's, it's all through the literature. Right. right. So when Albright established this idea that I was at Atel, then later Atel was excavated and this is the conclusion that was drawn. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. So um, now you started looking more closely at this back in, was it the 1980s, 1990s? Late, late 80s, early 90s. Right. right. So, and you started looking at the geography and the text and alternatives. So let's talk about how that happened mm -hmm. and what your thought process mm -hmm. was at that time. Well, of course, uh, ABR has been involved in this search from the beginning. That's why ABR was founded, was right. to do field work to locate I, because of course our founder, David Livingston, realized this is a major problem, a major issue. The I problem. The I problem, yes. So <clears throat> he began his research uh, at a site called Kerbert Nissia. And he thought this had possibilities, and I participated in that dig for quite a few seasons, but uh, the evidence just was not forthcoming. So I began thinking maybe it's at another site nearby or something. Right. And uh, I uh, uh, got a hold of a uh, survey 
that the Israelis had done in this area. In fact, I spent one day working with Israel Fickelstein out on the West Bank uh, during the time he was surveying sites out there. And I just was flipping through uh, that uh, report and I came to a, a plate uh, of pottery that looked to me to be pottery from the time of Joshua. And so that's what drew my interest to this particular uh, site called Kerbert El Makater. And it's only a few miles from Nisia. So it's, it's in the right, it's in the right of, area. Right area. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I began uh, doing uh, kind of little field trips whenever I was in Israel. I'd, I'd go there and uh, pick up pottery and look around and check the geography. And uh, pretty soon I, I was quite uh, convinced that this is a viable candidate uh, just because of the geography. And we'll probably get into that a little bit. Yes. But it fit the geography perfectly. And so I thought, wow, we need to excavate this site. We need to take a look further at yes. it, right? Yes. And this is part of research, you know, it's, it's not only just digging in the ground, but digging through the literature and the reading. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, uh, so there's two, two big facets to this kind of research. So we're gonna bring up a map uh, on the screen here just to show people uh, where it's located. And you can see in the map how close it is to Etel mm -hmm. and Kerbet El Makata are less than a mile from each yeah, other. Yeah, one kilometer. So in, in one sense, you can understand how a scholar might look at the region and say, oh, well, maybe that's, maybe that's I, mm -hmm. uh, meaning Etel. Right. Yes. Now, we're also going to take uh, another view here as, 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 we're, as we're looking at this. Our next one is an overhead view of the area. Uh, and uh, let's talk about this uh, just a little bit, uh, because I think this will help, help the audience sort of understand the, uh, the, the region a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So if you could just uh, talk about some of the cities that we see on there. Yes. Well, this is uh, taken... Uh, with uh, in the foreground, I believe that's Deer de Bois. I can't read the, <laughs> the writing, <laughs> but uh, we have over on the left our site, uh, Kerbet El Makater, and over on the right is uh, a site that's been identified as Bethel, and that's uh, Baytin. Do I have right. that right, Henry? That you do. <laughs> you can see it you're, better. You're than doing I can. great. Yeah. Uh, so we have <laughs> we have those two those sites, and the Bible we're going to talk in our next segment identifies these sites as being close to I. So, yes. but the picture gives the audience an idea of part of what our research is involved. It's not just digging in the ground, right. but it's looking at all of the variables in, involved mm -hmm. uh, in studying the Bible. So now let's talk a little bit. We have about a minute left in this segment. So we're going to show an overhead Google Earth view of Makater. Could you describe a little bit about like where it's located and how fun it was to walk there when we would go <laughs> dig there a little bit, just to give people an idea. Well, when I first went out there, that road that you see wasn't there, that was put in later. But uh, you can see the, the hill that it's located on and uh, uh, we had to take a bus every day from Jerusalem to get out there because it's on the West Bank and uh, get off the bus and then climb up the hill carrying yeah. all of our stuff. So uh, logistically, it was a challenge, but uh, we were able to, to do that and have uh, 14 seasons, I believe, all together, at least 14 years of, uh, of working there with a little break uh, during the Intifada. But uh, yes. the Lord just provided and uh, we were able to, to do our work there. Well, he certainly did. Uh, friends, please don't go away. We're going to continue on in our next segment, sharing with you uh, all the exciting evidence that we've discovered at Kerbet al Makater, which we believe is the eye of Joshua 7 and 8. And we'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm joined today with uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Bryant Wood, in the studio, who's a professional archaeologist and who led excavations at our site of Kerbet al Makater, which we believe is the eye of Joshua 7 and 8. Bryant? Um, we were talking in the last segment, just trying to lay a foundation for people to try to understand what it is we're talking about. You know, you and I, we live in this world. It's, it's almost old hat to us in terms of where the place is and what we do there and, 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 and the work that we've done. Um, so let's help walk the audience through some of the things that you observed in the scriptures. Because what, what's interesting is the narrative of Joshua 7-8 is rich with detail. 
Uh, and so there's a lot you can look for to correlate it with the Bible. So we're going to bring up um, uh, in, our, in our picture here uh, the strategic location of Ai. Mm -hmm. So Joshua sends the men up to the city uh, to scout it out. Talk mm -hmm. about that in Joshua 7-2. Mm -hmm. He sends them from Jericho up to Ai. Mm -hmm. Well, as an archaeologist, when I read these passages, certain things jump out, yes. you know. Uh, uh, as we know, uh, I was the second place the Israelites attacked when they came into the Promised Land, the first one being Jericho. Uh, and Jericho is down in the Jordan Valley. I, however, is up in the hill country. So now, Joshua is a, a smart fellow, a, a good general and leader, so he must have had a reason for picking this particular place as the first site he would attack in the central hill country. And here in Joshua 7, 2, that scripture verse that was there, uh, he is giving instructions to the uh, spies of uh, where this place is. And so he's saying it's east of Bethel, it's uh, uh, near Beth Avon. And so right away, uh, for an archaeologist, you say, well, okay, if I want to know where I is, I better know where Bethel is, and I better know where Beth Avon yes. is. And yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, uh, all three of these sites have been controversial as to where they're located. But that's part of the puzzle. Uh, to know where I is, we really have to identify Bethel, and we have to identify Beth Avon. Now, those are separate shows. Right. <laughs> We're not going right, to right, talk right. about that in this show, right. but uh, that's number one. But it's related. They're related. <laughs> yes, they're another. related. Yeah. And uh, we should expect that uh, I would be located in a strategic place because otherwise why bother with it? Yes. And uh, we'll probably talk about that. It is strategic. Very strategic. And we saw in the picture, if we could bring that back up, um, is that picture up, up there is looking south towards Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and you can see the towers in the background. That's yes. on the on the uh, north side of the Mount of Olives, isn't it? Right. So, the the military commander at that site has line of sight to Jerusalem. Absolutely. Now that's nine miles, but this is a nice clear day, so you yeah. can clearly see that yes, they could signal to Jerusalem. Well, uh, if if there was some invader coming from the north then the fortress there at I could send a signal. So uh, in the overall uh, strategy and, uh, so, and the layout of the sites, we would expect that this would be kind of a fortress outpost. It's kind of a border outpost. And uh, we find that it's located right on a wadi that's a dividing line between the territory of Jerusalem to the south and the territory of Shechem, of Shechem to, to the, the north. north. And when we say wadi, we mean a, a uh, riverbed. Dry riverbed. Dry riverbed yes. that runs through there. Yes, right. so it's very strategic. Very important. Okay, so we're going to bring up another, another picture. Um, one of the criteria that you identified was, as you mentioned, that the site has to be east of Bethel and near Beth Avon. So we're going to show that again. This is the picture we showed before, and we can see that in the screen. So as you were investigating this, you were looking at this matrix of evidence. Yes, To absolutely. make sure that the site has to fit this criteria. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of course, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. It's accurate. So the site has to fit what the text says. Yes. Right? Absolutely. That's the way we do it. Okay, so now another criteria that you identified was you had to find an adequate ambush site mm -hmm. because the text indicates that. Talk, talk a little bit about the ambush site and what Joshua did with his forces. Yes. The, the geography described is very unique because it talks about an ambush site on the uh, east side of uh, I, and so that should be a, a deep valley where you could hide a large force of men. Right, so, th so they couldn't see it from I. Right, yes. and so they could hide there until the right time when Joshua uh, gives the signal, then they could come out of hiding and uh, attack the uh, uh, men of I or the city of I or whatever. Uh, then on the other hand, we uh, find that uh, we have another valley mentioned. It's on the north side of I, and it should be shallow. And that's the valley where Joshua took a small force when they first arrived uh, in chapter 8 at the site with the whole yes. Israelite army. Uh, Joshua took a small force and camped overnight in the valley 
uh, just on the north side of Ai. Well, uh, we read how the commander of the fortress came out and was able to see Joshua and yes. the Israelites. So it was a shallow valley. Right. They yeah. weren't hidden from sight. So, so the text doesn't say it's a shallow valley, no. but you're inferring that it from has, the narrative. It has so, that, to be. So, so in it, the king comes out in the morning and he sees Joshua's army. Now, uh, what, what Joshua has done here, this strategy is from the Lord, right? <laughs> God has given yes. him this strategy. Yes. He's baiting the king, isn't Absolutely. he? Absolutely. Right? He wants him to come out because the ambush force is on the other side. Mm -hmm. So we could bring up here um, also on the screen this picture of the shallow valley looking north. Uh, we can see two things. One is uh, we can see how shallow it is. And the second thing we can see is on the, on the very top of the screen there, we can see that ridge. Talk about that that ridge up there and yes. why that would be significant for the battle. Well, of uh, another, th another thing we read in Scripture is when Joshua brought his army up there, he put the main uh, force on a hill north of Ai. And so, again, that must be a very important hill. And this hill north of our site is the highest hill in the whole area. So from that vantage point, his generals could look down and see the entire battlefield. And so uh, that was a very uh, a strategic location for the army, and it fits, again, the landscape that we have. So these are unique features. How many sites are going to have these features with a deep valley on one side, a shallow valley on the north side, a very high hill beyond that for the army. For the amb yep, right. Yeah, right. so it, it just fits perfectly. You don't even have to put a shovel in the ground to see that, but yeah. you need to get the archaeological evidence if you want to prove, hey, this was the place of I. Yeah, and this, is, and this is part of the work that we've done at ABR is, is we look at the biblical text very carefully. And then when we have these indicators, geography, geography is, is a great um, a tool that we can use to show the Bible's accuracy, isn't it? Yes. Uh, especially in the, in the I account. Mm -hmm. Yes. In, in, that, uh, in Joshua 7 and 8, we have a listing of uh, 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 quite a number, six or seven geographical features that are mentioned, and then we have archaeological features. So when I read through there and I read about a gate, ah, it must be fortified. Well, we're going to talk about the gate in the <laughs> next segment. So folks, uh, don't go away. We're going to talk about the gate and other discoveries from the city of I. We'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm joined today by archaeologist Dr. Bryant Wood, uh, Director of Research with the Associates for Biblical Research. Uh, today we've been talking about in our first two segments the city of Ai in Joshua 7 and 8. And so far we've, we've laid the foundation for folks to understand uh, the research that we've done there. First, the biblical text and some of what it says and some of the geography. So now let's turn, uh, we're going to give a taste of, of some of the archaeological discoveries here. And then we're going to have another episode. We're, we have a whole episode to talk about more of the archaeology, which is your area of expertise. We'll talk about that more. So let's talk about a little bit um, some of the requirements. The first is the city gate. Let's, mm -hmm. talk, let's talk about that a little yes. bit, if you would, please. Well, uh, as we mentioned in the last segment, we have both geographical features in these chapters, but we also have archaeological uh, features. I mentioned when an archaeologist reads through the scripture, you know, he sees things that maybe the average reader would not. Right. But uh, we do have archaeological requirements. And so we uh, read in chapter 7 and chapter 8 about a gate. Well, this tells us this place was fortified. And so we should expect to find not only a gate, but fortification walls around the site. And in our very first visit or season, I should say, uh, at the site where we were doing some exploration, we found a gate socket stone. It was visible on the surface. And so this uh, really kind of got us started yes. uh, in, into the fortification system because we were able to right away excavate the gate that's mentioned in in Joshua the biblical 70. account, yeah, yeah, and it's very a very explicit mention. I mean, this is this is kind of a sad moment here, and it's because the Israelites they kill the king. 
Yeah. The king of Ai, mm -hmm. and they bury him in the in the the city gate. Yeah, yeah. So this is an important detail that's found in the text. So we're going to talk about our discovery of the gate. Now we have to tell the audience we didn't find the king of Ai. No, no, no. no. But we we did <laughs> we did find the city gate, and mm -hmm. we're going to talk about we're going to talk about that uh, uh, right now. So let's take a look at this view north, which we actually showed before. But in the foreground, you can see the gate. T tell the story a little bit about how that was discovered and, and mm -hmm. how excited you guys were when yeah, that happened. Yeah, in 1995 we found the gate socket stone and uh, in subsequent seasons then we uh, excavated the area and you can see uh, kind of a horseshoe shape there in the photo. That's one chamber of this gate and we could see the tops of those stones right on the surface. That's the beauty of a curbert. You know, it's just a kind of a level ruin, right. not a tell with many layers. Right, like Tel Aviv, uh, Tel Hatsur, places yeah, like that. Yeah, Tel Megiddo. Right. So, right. Uh, I mean, we're talking about an event that took place in 1406 B.C., 3,400 years ago. And to think that you could see uh, a structure from that time at the surface is quite amazing, yeah. but that's the way it is in archaeology. You never, you never know what you're going to find, When right? you're dealing with a curbert, because you, know, you right. don't have layers of occupation over right. covering it. Covering right. it. So let's show so, that, we're going to show the drawing, I'm sorry, I didn't go ahead. interrupt you. We're going to show the drawing of the gate, and then the, uh, just see, uh, there's the big picture of it. And then in our next picture, we're going to show a close-up of that west chamber. So talk yes. about that. that, that's the key evidence right yes, there. Yes, we see the socket stones uh, there, just below, at the bottom of that picture. And we found uh, one initially, the large one there on the right was the one that we saw popping up out of the surface. But as we excavated, we found a second one to the left, a little bit smaller, but nevertheless too large to be connected with just a simple house. This is from a large, large structure. And we, we are familiar with these kinds of uh, socket stones from other digs. So we know it's from a city gate. And uh, so from there, then we excavated that kind of a U-shaped uh, uh, outline there. Yes. And we had one chamber. Now, unfortunately, the other chambers were not there. We have a lot of robbing of stones from the earlier uh, period of the Fortress of Ai uh, for buildings that were constructed later in the Iron right. Age, in uh, late Hellenistic, early Roman, even up into the Byzantine period, yeah. they were robbing out stones for their construction. So it was a quarry for them. So they didn't care about us doing archaeology no, no. in the 21st century. They were concerned <laughs> about building a house, and they didn't yeah. care it was from yeah. the time of Joshua, right, or building for a fortification. Fortunately, they used this one chamber for other purposes yeah. later on, and so it survived. Yeah, so in the providence of God, uh, we're very fortunate that, that it was there because uh, it should absolutely. have, in theory, been robbed out. Oh, huh? yes. yes. Yeah. So that was awesome. So we saw those, those socket stones. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, it took, we took those off the site. It took like three or four guys to load those into oh, a truck, heavy. right? Yes, absolutely. They were gigantic. <laughs> yes, very which, heavy. Which indicates it was not for a domestic structure. No, no, yeah. no. So a large fortification. Now, in our next picture here, we're going we're gonna to talk about the fortifications because this is actually very important, not just for the description in Joshua, but the bigger picture of this period. The, um, the biblical account indicates in uh, Deuteronomy and in Numbers that when the spies went in the land, they said the cities are great mm -hmm. and walled up to heaven. Yes. Giant fortification structure. Now here's a uh, structure. Here's what we think the city looked yes. like. Yes, there's our gate on the right. Yep, and high, high the we thought the walls were. And then we're going to show just one picture of some of the remnants mm -hmm. here of Dr. Oral Collins standing on mm -hmm. top of those. Um, and, and in that, uh, tell, tell folks how big and wide these walls were and how tall we think they were. Mm -hmm. We have just uh, remnants remaining of the fortress, bits and pieces here and there right. uh, because of this robbing out. But we have enough uh, left that we're able to pretty well reconstruct the entire circuit of the walls and some towers and uh, just amazing features. Yes. And uh, we found that we find where we do find remnants, it's just the foundation. Uh, that's about it. 
And we found that the wall is, uh, f was four meters wide. Well, that's about, what, 14, 15 feet well, when you huge. convert it to feet. Yes, yes, one of the widest walls found in Israel. It's amazing. And so this uh, was a heavily fortified site. It's small, like two and a half acres, but heavily fortified because of the fact, I believe, it was this border outpost kind of defending Jerusalem from the north. And Absolutely. so kind of a rule of thumb is that the wall would probably be, uh, be about three times as high as wide. So if you're talking 15 feet wide, you're talking about Huge. 40, 50 feet high. It's unbelievable. Excellent. Well, Dr. Wood, we have to end it right there. But friends, we're inviting you back to come back for part two of this episode. We are just getting started talking about how accurate the biblical account is when we compare it to our dig at Kerbin El Makader. We hope that you'll join us and you'll be encouraged by the research that we've done there. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>